Picturing culture. Picturing culture, a critical look at cultural representation in children's picture books and intentional inclusivity practices at the Los Angeles Public Library. Written and narrated by Courtney Taylor Grotto. When children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read, or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. Rudine Sims Bishop. Introduction. Hi, I'm Courtney. That's me. When I was young, I loved books. I learned so much about myself and the world through books. I was a quiet, introverted kid, and that's how I explored. Books were my first love. Here are a few of my favorites. My idea of a perfect day was when the mythical scholastic book fair came to my school, and I could look at the seemingly endless library of books, so many that I could only hope to be able to read all of them someday. In fact, I still feel that way about books today. This is my daughter. When she was little, she was just like me. Books were her first love, too. I read to her all the time, and soon she was reading all on her own. We made frequent trips to Barnes & Noble and the library, where we would bring home as many books as we could hold. One day, in 2005, I noticed a book on display with penguins on the cover, and Tango makes three. She loved penguins, and I opened the book to read the dusk jacket's flap, and I saw something that I had never seen before. A story of a family that looked, well, different. Two penguin dads were raising an adopted chick. At the time, our family looked different too. Me, my daughter, and my girlfriend. I realized that I had never seen a book like it. And then I thought of all of the children my daughter was in school with, how their families all looked different. And I wondered how many of those children had seen a picture book with someone that looked like them. We took the book home, and I used it to show her that all families and people are different, and it's our uniqueness that makes us beautiful together. I still have the book today, and I've remained curious about the question of representation in children's books throughout my adult life. When I decided to go back to school to finish my degree at UCLA, I decided that I wanted to find some answers and see how I could help. So, what is a picture book? Well, for the purpose of my research, a picture book is defined as using narrative and illustration to tell a story. Picture books are generally published for children of ages between two and eight years old, but of course, people of all ages can enjoy them. Creaney puts it best, Picture books augment the storyteller's message by extending the text through the development of character, setting, and mood. Chapter 1 Once Upon a Time in Children's Books So how did children's books start? Well, they're actually a relatively new form of print media with origins in the late 18th century. Originally, they were made to convey religious morals and values, and then they were produced for educational purposes, to teach the ABCs and basic reading skills. And then, much later, they began to be written to stimulate children's imagination and were published for pleasure reading. Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll was the first children's book that was a bestseller for all ages. It was written in 1865. About 100 years later was the golden age of children's literature, with books like The Wizard of Oz, Dick and Jane, Dr. Seuss, and fairy tales, and Disney stories becoming popular. But the common theme throughout this time was the homogeny of whiteness in the stories. 
There were so many stories to be told, but no one was telling them. Not everyone could see themselves in books, and sometimes, if someone was of a different race or culture and they did happen to be in a book, the representation wasn't very nice. Other races and cultures often saw themselves relegated to the periphery of white characters' stories, if they were depicted at all. They had to face negative representation, stereotyping, and persistent racism, whether it was deliberate or not. The very first picture book to feature a protagonist of color in a positive light was A Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats in 1962. You read that right. 1962. Over time, our perception of children changed and now we know that they have more needs. Contemporary children's literature experiments with form and content and has seen a shift towards real, politically correct, and sometimes controversial subjects. The history of children's literature can be seen as a succession of changing cultural codes, featuring messages that convey child codes as well as adult codes. Chapter 2. Diversity Matters. Since the civil rights movement of the 1960s, children's books have moved away from blatant stereotypes and racism, but there still is a huge disparity in representation. Scholars estimate that from the 1960s to present, just 3 to 25 percent of children's books are diverse in any given year. Diversity and representation matters because it influences identity, positively affects our perception of other cultures, and has the ability to reduce prejudice. All great things. Rudine Sims Bishop, an educator considered the mother of multicultural children's literature, created a theory around representation in children's books where they act as mirrors, windows, and doors. Mirror books help readers see their own lives reflected in the pages. Window books help readers have the view of lives and stories that are different from their own. And door books help readers feel transported into the world of a story and to feel empathy for the characters. It's really important that every child feels seen and heard through the stories that they read. And the messages matter. Children's books are vehicles for change, and they should be free of racial stereotypes and depict cultures as valuable and complex, rather than just in relation to white culture. Chapter 3. The Public Library, Contact Zones, and Acts of Resistance. For my research, I wanted to look at children's books and libraries because they offer access to all people in the community from all walks of life. This, in fancy academic terms, is called a contact zone. The value and function of public libraries are equity or impartiality, fairness and justice for all people, inclusion or the equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized, and accessibility, an attribute or quality that makes a place or experience open to all. And it's free. This is the LA Public Library. It is located in the heart of downtown Los Angeles a city of almost 4 million people. Why Los Angeles? Well, because it's so large and multicultural. In fact, according to the 2021 census, over 50% are considered diverse. This is their children's literature department. Their collection has 
over 250,000 books in 24 languages. And in 2021, they circulated, or people checked out, over 31,974 picture books. And 9,765 of those are unique titles. In the summer of 2022, I analyzed their circulation report and their visual displays of books for markers of race, ethnicity, other diversity, and richness of narrative. I found that of the top 100 circulated books, only eight featured a main character of color, and only one directly depicted diversity as a concept. Not only that, in the top 100 circulated books, only 10 were authored by a person of color. The statistics show that there is definitely still a huge disparity in representation, as well as in what is being checked out in a major library in a majorly diverse city. However, there were a few rare gems found in the top 100 that feature diverse families, culture, and the experience of immigrants. Throughout my visits, I documented all of the displayed books and found that less than 10% of those books were not considered diverse. My observations in the reading room and at community outreach events also showed that the patrons were highly diverse. It seemed like, despite the disparity in book publishing and even in their circulation, the librarians were making sure that their department served the patrons from all walks of life. This can be interpreted as intentional acts of resistance and intentional design, a human-centered design process that embraces diversity, giving patrons priceless opportunity to engage with one another in both the physical and metaphorical space of a contact zone. Basically, they're making sure that everyone feels welcome and included. But this leaves some big questions for future research like, why does the circulation report in a city as diverse and as big as LA mirror the disparity in national publishing statistics? Afterward. The study of cultural representation in children's books and public libraries as contact zones for culture remains relevant because of the enduring lack of diversity in publishing, but also because of the resurgence of book banning and because of the defunding and closures of some public libraries. So I will leave you with a call to action. Please support your local library. Please support authors of color and stories about lives that may look different from your own. Every child should see themselves reflected in the books on the shelf, as well as be able to see and learn about the richness of others. That leads to empathy, understanding, and respect. They are stories worth telling. Thanks for listening. The End